So good evening, everybody. Before I begin the meeting, could I acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture? Uh, I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the countries from which you will come to. Tonight, we're starting our series of international research webinars for the new China Studies Center. We are inviting excellent researchers who are good presenters from all over the world to come and talk about their current topics of research. And our very first celebrated speaker is Dr. Williams from Xi'an Jiaotong Liverpool University. Uh, she is, um, although an early career researcher, one of the most interesting people on Chinese culture I've ever heard talk. And that's why we invited her to come and speak. She's going to talk about red relics in context, the collection, collecting largely of red relics in contemporary China and what that means for contemporary Chinese society. This is taken, of course, from her forthcoming book, which will be published in the near future by Roman and Littlefield. So I'm sure you, Emily will answer questions towards the end, but in the meantime, over to you, Emily. We're all very pleased to have you here. Great, thank you so much, David, for that really kind introduction. Uh, and thank you also to Ping for all of the help in organization. Um, and thank you to everybody who has attended. It's um, quite amazing to see so many people here and it's really, um, an honor for me to, to give this talk. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm not actually seeing the chat right now. So um, perhaps Ping, if there's any problems, you could just um, interrupt and let me know. Okay, so um, my title today is The Changing Role of Red Relics in Contemporary China. Um, just one thing I would say is I've put my email address on the slide. Um, if anybody has any comments or wants to continue the discussion with me after the end of the, the talk today, um, I absolutely welcome that. So please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, so let's see if my PowerPoint works. There we go. This year marked the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. And as I'm sure you can all imagine, this was met with much celebration across China. Every municipality, it seems, tried to find some way to link their own local history with the larger story of national rejuvenation under the CCP, particularly through the promotion of glorious historical events dating from the Sino-Japanese uh, war period or the Civil War, events, in other words, from the pre-1949 period. This brought a rare spotlight to the individuals who collect these types of historical objects, um, who, who are called red collectors, um, whose objects were used in their own and government-sponsored exhibitions throughout the country. Um, and yet, despite this new prominence, um, I'll suggest in my talk today that red collectors remain, despite their best efforts, in something of an ambiguous position vis-a-vis -vis the party state due to the nature of the objects that they collect. So in my talk today, I'm going to briefly introduce you to the field of red collecting and red collectors by introducing you to just a couple of the collectors and their objects. And then I'm gonna to try to trace a brief history of red collecting starting in the cultural revolution, going through the reform era and up to the present. Um, and then I'm going to try to situate all of this um, in the broader interest in all things red that has emerged in China, particularly in the context of this year's 100th anniversary. And I want to suggest that while on the one hand, this interest in red culture and the CCP's red history is a benefit to red collectors, on the other hand, the more limited understanding of what actually counts as red culture continues to delegitimize de many of the objects that most frequently are collected. Um, so here's just a brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about red collecting, the first question, of course, is what are red relics? Um, and I think if you know anything about Chinese history, you can probably guess, right? Whatever kind of comes to your mind is, is probably correct, right? You're probably thinking of things like uh, Chairman Mao badges, propaganda posters, Mao busts, um, and these are indeed key sectors of the field. But the field of, of red collectibles of, um, of Hongsu Wenhua or Hongsu Wenwu, red relics or red culture, is actually much, much broader than this. Um, and I've kind of got like a long list of all of the things that it, it continues, um, it, it incorporates. So we've got everything from porcelains, textiles, 
uh, money, ration coupons, um, cigarette cartons, alcohol uh, bottles, um, clothing, both military and civilian, military goods, as well as other objects from daily life that share this socialist aesthetic. Um, the objects that immediately come to mind uh, might predominantly come from the Cultural Revolution, um, but for red collectors, the term red era uh, also encompasses the whole of the Mao period um, and the revolutionary period that precedes it. Now, different collectors have slightly different definitions of what actually constitutes red culture, um, but for my purposes today, I'm going to define it as anything made between 1921, when the CCP was founded, and 1976, when Mao died, um, and that contains an aesthetic or political connection to the Communist Party, the Red Army, or PLA, and the People's Republic of China. Um, and this includes uh, not just kind of official documents, um, but also anything to do with kind of art, culture, um, or daily life. So um, you can see on the PowerPoint uh, a whole series of enamel mugs um, that's owned by a Beijing collector. So who are China's red collectors? Uh, the former head of the National Red Collecting Association, uh, Ji Yuchang, estimated a few years ago that there were some 1 million people involved in red collecting in China in some capacity, whether as serious collectors, as hobbyists, um, individuals with anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand um, objects, or sellers, uh, often uh, individuals or, or couples um, who have stores, market stalls, uh, and use the internet to connect collectors with objects. Collectors are typically middle-aged men uh, who might have been children during the Mao years. Um, they're fairly evenly split in my experience between those born in the 1950s and those born in the 60s. Um, there are, in my experience, very few uh, women collectors, uh, and I've met only a handful of collectors under the age of 40. They're mostly Han Chinese, um, and the most common time to start collecting was in the 1990s. Um, so uh, I've listed um, kind of categories of collections on the, the slide, and I want to introduce you to just a few collectors um, to give you a sense of the diversity of the field. Um, and uh, I've sort of found a kind of typology or a sort of set of categories to tie together um, these types of collections. Um, but of course, I should say right from the start that any type of typology or category um, necessarily has all sorts of limitations. Um, so uh, I just would like to acknowledge that at the start. Okay, so perhaps the most uh, obvious and most commonly used uh, way of defining collections is by medium. Um, and within this, the big categories tend to be badges and medals, uh, propaganda posters, coins, stamps, and literature and documents. There are also a whole series of much more niche collections that are also based on medium, um, including university graduation certificates, uh, notebooks, uh, and um, cigarette packages. The most common um, is badge collectors. Um, and there's a fairly obvious reason for this. There was a huge number of badges produced in the period 1966 to 69. Um, it's estimated that between two and five billion badges were made. Um, and of course, they're relatively durable, so they've lasted fairly well. One collector estimated that perhaps 90% of badges were destroyed or just lost in the late 70s and 80s. But even if we consider the low end of the estimate, 2 billion, um, if we have just 10% left, that still leaves 20 million left to be collected. Um, and badges were produced most commonly in aluminium, but there are also uh, those in plexiglass, in porcelain, in bamboo, um, and other mediums. Um, and there are tens of thousands of different styles and sizes. And so it's a, it's a very rich category of collecting because there's actually a huge amount of diversity um, within what might seem to be a kind of limited category. Now, to be taken seriously as a collector, you need to have um, 10,000 uh, distinct, unique badges plus a smaller collection of something more niche. So um, on the slide, uh, I've got some badges from the collection of Li Jun, who's a clothing company executive from Ningbo, who started collecting about eight years ago and now has well over 30,000 badges. Um, most of his badges are, of course, from the, the Cultural Revolution, but he also has a smaller and more rare collection of military medals uh, from the 1950s. So this is what kind of gives his collection um, its uh, prominence. A second category might be called locational. 
Um, so the focus is less on what the object is and more on where it comes from. Um, and these collections much more frequently relate to the revolutionary period rather than the Mao years. Um, so uh, a collector called Xu Haihang from Jingbian Shanji, um, he collects objects from the 30s and 40s, which relate to the Shanghai border region, which was the sort of main base area of the Communist Party at this time. Um, his collection is limited in terms of time and place, as he only collects things with some relation to the Shanghai border region. But within this, he'll collect things of any medium, government documents, cotton or grain coupons, cloths and household items. This sort of collection has impeccable revolutionary heritage, but it's also fairly niche and as a result, a bit more limited in terms of its financial value. And he displays this collection in, he calls it a museum, it's really more of a storage space um, in Jingbian near Yudin, uh, which is a few hours north of Yan'an as well as at a small museum in his hometown of Zhejiang. Um, <clears throat> and the idea of kind of locational collection is often a subsection of other collections. So for example, um, there's a Mao badge collector in Bambu Anhui, who has a subsection of his badges um, that focus on Anhui in particular. And then finally, in terms of categories of collections, we might think of collections in terms of themes. Um, and these types of collections often have to do with their collectors' personalities or personal histories. Um, so I know in Shanghai, a former pediatrician who collects things to do with medicine and medical history. Um, one particularly interesting uh, thematic collector is an individual named Ho Feng from Shanxi province who collects things to do with the East is Red. Some 10 years ago, Ho Feng met the grandson of the creator of the original song, The East is Red, um, and he decided to collect things to do with it as it married his love for Mao with his interest in local traditional folk songs. So the East is Red was a song first written during the, Jap the Sino-Japanese War, um, but it became known across China when it was turned into a song and dance epic in 1964 to celebrate the PRC's 15th anniversary. And this fame means that you see the East is Red across a wide variety of media, um, porcelain, posters, badges, daily life objects, etc. Um, and Ho Fong has collected over a thousand of these objects, uh, which he displays in an exhibition hall in Yunnan. So hopefully, as you can see from just this very, very brief introduction to a couple of collectors, um, red collecting is a really diverse field, and that there are almost unlimited categories of objects collected. While it includes objects from the pre-1949 revolutionary period, it is dominated, I suggest, by objects from the Mao years. And I think there are two reasons for this. The first is simple availability. Billions of Mao badges and propaganda posters and other objects were made in the years 1949 to 1976. So there's just more available. But I think the second reason relates to how the field of collecting has formed um, in the Mao years, but more importantly, during the reform and opening period. Um, and this is what I now want to go on to look at. Um, okay, so red collecting um, started during the Mao era itself. Um, I actually suspect it may have started during the uh, revolutionary period, although I don't have evidence of this, but it certainly started soon after liberation. So there's an individual called Wang Anting who passed away in 2011 and who was long one of China's best known collectors. He got an early version of a Mao badge in May 1951, bought from the market in Changdu. He built up a collection, particularly during the Cultural Revolution, often accepting badges as payment um, for doing odd jobs. Wang, uh, then a young man, had little money or education and few prospects. In Wang's mind, Mao's rise to power signaled a profound reversal in fortunes for China's poorest, and his collecting was a way of sort of um, demonstrating this devotion. Um, I think collecting as early as Wang is probably fairly rare, but certainly by the time of the Cultural Revolution, um, people start to collect uh, essentially badges. And cultural revolution collecting is a really interesting phenomenon because it was in a way the most anti-capitalistic, anti-bourgeois time in the Mao era, but it also saw the production of the most stuff. So I already mentioned um, that between two and five billion Mao badges were made. I can break that down just a little bit to help you understand the scale of production. Um, we normally think of Mao badges becoming really popular in August of 1966. Uh, this is when the Cultural Revolution kind of swings up a gear and we have the first of the Red Guard rallies in Tiananmen Square. Uh, 
um, where Mao was personally presented with a number of badges and he dons the red card armband. Now, China then, as of course now, uh, is a country that can mobilize quickly. And already by September of 1966, um, a government document, document stated that Beijing had a production capacity of 250,000 badges per day. Um, but even this was insufficient to meet demand. Such was the demand for badges that allocation of resources became an important political task. Um, and over the period of October to December 1967, the government allocated sufficient um, aluminium and copper to produce 200 million badges around the country, um, or over 2 million per day. Now, with such a profusion of badges being produced, a number of things happen. Firstly, badges become more intricate, larger, often more colorful, um, and made from different materials. Secondly, some people start to accumulate badges. I think the average person is probably not accumulating badges. They maybe just have one or two for the political safety it could bring. But some people wanted more and bigger and better badges as a sign of their loyalty to Mao, as well as for the cultural capital that this could bring. And I think we should be careful not to just write this off as, as brainwashing. And thirdly, as people competed to get the newest, biggest, and most colorful badges, very quickly markets begin to spring up in major cities and collections emerge pr uh, primarily among the young red guards. <clears throat> now, Mao himself was known to disapprove of badge collecting. Um, he prevented, for example, Lin Biao's wife, Ye Chun, from giving him her collection of some 10,000 badges um, as a birthday present in 1966. And archival documents from the time also speak to the real anxiety that sprung up around the acquisition of badges. A May 1967 document issued by the Shanghai Revolutionary Committee, for example, acknowledges that people wear badges to show their ardent love for Chairman Mao. <coughs> but at the same time, the document voiced fears that engaging in market practices to develop a badge collection would foster capitalist thinking, damaging the impressionable youths undertaking the activity and broader society. There were also concerns that some people were deliberately engaging in speculation and thus serving their own private interests. So we have a slightly odd situation where throughout 1967 and 68, while the government is producing ever more badges to try to meet demand, local government is also trying to stamp out these badge markets. So collecting, particularly of badges, but also of posters and other objects, certainly took place during the Mao era, but it was something of a double-edged sword. It might be a reflection of a love for Mao, and having the nicest or the most badges um, could certainly get you kind of kudos from the people around you, but it also opened you up to a type of skepticism that perhaps you weren't collecting for the right reasons. And I think, to a certain extent, various versions of these tensions have followed red collectors ever since. Um, now, after Mao's death, uh, the government recalled much of the material culture from this time. Little red books were popped, badges were recycled. Um, and I actually know of at least one collector who had built up a collection of badges during the Cultural Revolution, but who, in line with government requirements, um, actually turned everything in to be recycled. So there is then something of a dividing line between collecting during the Mao era and collecting during the Reform era, um, although, of course, not everyone was as confined as that one collector. Um, and indeed, many collectors or would-be collectors realized that these government recalls were great opportunities to collect. Savvy collectors made deals with recycling centers and got whole bags of badges set to be recycled or little red books to be pulped. Or they just looked in dumpsters, particularly in areas slated for destruction or renovation. This way, they could easily and cheaply acquire large numbers of objects. <clears throat> Most English language literature on collecting has understood this early collecting as representing a form of nostalgia for the supposed purity of the Mao years and a rejection of the changes of the reform era, which saw China become richer, but also more corrupt and unequal. It became a significant trend in the late 1980s when the changes were having social impact and enough time had passed from the late Mao years for nostalgia to set in. Now, around the 100th anniversary of Mao's birth in 1993, a more widespread interest in Mao arose, which gets called the Mao Ru or Mao Fever. And this helped to stimulate the development of a market. Um, a number of badge and stamp collectors published catalogs of their collections at this time. And um, some of these, uh, interestingly, contained estimated values. 
This then reflects the second main way uh, that collecting is discussed in the literature as a form of economic speculation, um, basically just as a way of making money. Now, the earliest collecting trends um, tended to be for things that conform with our expectations of collectibles, stamps, uh, money, badges. But as the collecting field grew, as market prices rose, and as these newly historical objects become legitimized as relics, the field diversified. And um, so posters, for example, were one of the hottest objects um, later in the 90s and into the 2000s, until they reached the point where excellent examples can be worth thousands of yuan each. Many collectors now think that the market for posters is overheated and have moved on to over uh, to other areas. Um, particularly in the past few years, I've noticed a lot of people collecting uh, documents, um, paper documents of various sorts, uh, and daily life objects. And so we've seen over time collections become more niche and often more regionally specific. Now, when collecting um, first began, it wasn't called red collecting. It was usually just identified by the type of object that was collected badge collecting, stamp collecting, etc. The term um, red collections first emerged around 2006 uh, when the first red collecting association was founded in Hunan. The term was solidified in 2011 when the National Badge Collection Association changed its name to become the Chinese Collectors Association Red Collection Committee. Um, these collecting associations have terrible names. Uh, so it's the, the Zhongguo Shoshan Jia Xie Hui Hong Si Shoshan Wei Yuan Hui. Um, and then a second national level collection, Red Collection Association, was founded in 2017, uh, the Chinese Red Research Association, Red Collectors Professional Committee. So if I had to um, identify perhaps the most important trait in the development of red collecting in the last um, 10 or 15 years, it would be this professionalization. And there's also been with this a greater legitimation of the field. Red, red relics of various sorts have been recognized as cultural relics by the government. And both of the two associations that I just mentioned have formal government approval under the Ministry of Culture. Many collectors um, have also uh, set up either local um, collecting associations, or they've set up their own museums and memorial halls um, in which to share their objects with the public, sometimes on their own and sometimes in conjunction with the local government and with widely varying levels of professionalism. So I can just show you some photos. This is uh, Liu Jian's um, uh, small museum in Bangu and Hui. Uh, and this is Yang Yu's Mao, Mao Zedong Memorial Hall in Gao Beijian. <clears throat> so I think there's quite some distance between the early collectors of the 1980s, such as Wang Anting, who ran his own collection association and opened a little Mao museum in Chengdu, and for whom a dedication to Mao was at least an implicit statement of criticism towards the reform era politics. Um, there's quite a distance from that to the senior members of today's collecting associations, most of whom are party members and who have had careers in the party, the state, or the military. Collecting has moved from a somewhat marginalized, even perhaps subversive subculture to now sort of describing themselves as patriotic and loyal members of mainstream culture. And the leadership of these associations are very keen to show their adherence to the party state, and in particular, their alignment with the party's narratives of history. And one of the things that's been rather helpful for them in their efforts to do this has been Xi Jinping's adoption of the language of red, um, particularly in his pushes to study party history. So as early as 2014, um, Xi encouraged the military to make good use of the red resources, carry forward the red tradition well, and pass on the red gene well. Um, and I, I won't read through all of the quotes, but they're just a sort of handful of the times in which um, Xi, or um, in some cases, the State Council, has used this language of red and red gene um, in order to promote their policies. Um, so particularly if we're thinking about what's happening now in the context of the 2021 campaign to study party history, uh, Xi Jinping again encouraged the party to um, carry forward the red tradition, inherit the red genes, continue the spiritual lineage of the communists, and always maintain the revolutionary spirit of fearless struggle. And collectors now frequently use this language to imply that they have government support and that their goals align with those of Xi the party. Um, and we can see this at a museum in, in Jingbian, the Jingbian Red Collection Exhibition Hall. Um, you sort of have to go up a set of staircases uh, to the second floor to reach um, the museum. And the first thing you actually see 
is um, the, the slogan about um, making good use of red resources that you can see on the PowerPoint. So even before you get to the theatrical exhibition hall and you see this bust of Mao, we first start with the words of Xi. And I think what Xi's use of this language of red also hints at is this re-emphasis on history that has taken place in recent years, and particularly an emphasis on the role of the CCP in China's rejuvenation. One of the most popular slogans in 2019, for example, was don't forget the original intention, keep the mission in mind. Uh, now, I, I don't think anybody would claim that she himself is a great historian, but he certainly understands the power of historical metaphors. He called in April this year, for example, uh, on people to stand together on the country's new long march uh, to achieve the second centenary goal. And he also understands very well the power of historical symbolism. Um, after being reconfirmed in his position at the last party Congress in, in 2017, his first official visit was to the site of the first party Congress in Shanghai. And he's a frequent visitor of red tourism sites and that I'll talk about in just a moment. Now on the surface, this return to history benefits the red collectors as the holders of the historical proof of this narrative. And as I've said, they're keen to adopt this language of the red genes and red traditions to justify their actions. But at the same time, what is clear is that not everyone shares the same understanding of what constitutes red and what role these relics play in the passing on of the red gene. So I think we can understand this in the context of the rise of red tourism and um, tourism related to key sites in party history, um, but again, crucially, primarily pre-49 history. Um, so I've just got two uh, images there. The first one is, um, Interesting, you can see the sort of individual woman. Um, that's actually uh, Mao's grandniece, and this is at uh, a red tourism site in Shandong. And then the other uh, photo shows um, students at one of the key revolutionary sites in, in Yunnan. Now, according to state media, more than 800 million travels take place every year to red tourism locations, um, and over 180 sites were refurbished by the state in the run up to the 2021 centenary celebrations. To take just one example, uh, Jinggangshan in Jiangxi province, uh, which is where Mao and others created the first rural base area in 1927, had 790,000 visitors in the first quarter of 2021, um, helping to generate uh, something like 565 million yuan for the local economy. This is uh, around 120 million Aussie dollars uh, or 64 million pounds. Red tourism then clearly is big business, and sometimes red tourism and red collecting overlap. The Jianchuan Museum cluster in Amren, Sichuan, a few hours away from Chengdu, um, being a prime example. It's owned by the mega collector Fan Jianchuan, who displays his objects covering the breadth of 20, 20th century history in some 20 odd museums, uh, including numerous museums on uh, the Sino Japanese War period as well as the Mao years. But quite frequently, red tourism and red collecting do not overlap. Uh, a curious phenomenon is that very frequently the so-called historical relics on display at red tourism sites are replicas rather than real objects. A collector in Yan'an told me somewhat smugly uh, that his own collection was better than that of the Yan'an Revolutionary Memorial Museum, one of the central red tourism sites in Yan'an. More broadly, while Western museums now typically go for an approach of privileging objects over text with the intention to let the object speak. Quite the opposite is the norm at red tourism sites, which opt for lengthy explanatory panels, replica dioramas, um, and um, blown up and often poor quality uh, photographs and charts, rather than the display of historical relics themselves. Shops and stalls um, that surround these red tourism sites or are even situated within them um, typically sell fake or replica objects for tourists to take home as souvenirs. This speaks then to a lack of interest in authenticity and historicity of these objects that the collectors have dedicated their lives to. And I think more fundamentally, there's a disconnect over what counts as a red relic and who gets to make that determination. At the start of this talk, I defined it as anything with, with aesthetic or political connections to the Communist Party, uh, the, the Red Army or PLA or the PRC made between uh, 1921 and 1976. At the Jianchuan Museum cluster, however, the Red Era series of museums covers only the period of the Mao years. Um, and interestingly, when this museum, when these museums are talked about in Western press, they're typically called cultural revolution museums, so even further restricted um, from the Mao years. 
But when the party uses, um, when the party state uses the language of red, such as in red tourism, it refers almost exclusively to the pre-1949 period. And this disconnect has become even more apparent in the context of the centenary celebrations, which has seen schools around China in the past six months or so um, host events aiming to inherit the red genes and tell China's story well. Um, so, Chan Chang Feng Su Jian, Jiang Ka Zhong Guo Shi, in which red refers almost exclusively, again, to the pre 1949 period and largely excludes anything that came after. Um, and this can be seen in a campaign run in Suzhou, where I am, um, last spring called the Search for Red Treasures. It was run by the Suzhou Municipal Education Bureau and Suzhou Broadcasting Television Station. And it asked for school children to search for red treasures in their household um, and to upload photos of them uh, to a WeChat platform to describe the, the Hongzhugusha, the red story related to these objects. Um, a number of entries were then filmed and short videos were shown on local television and on Weibo. Now in the call for entries, they don't exactly uh, define what counts as a red treasure. Um, all they say really is that this, these red treasures must have red stories. Um, while they leave the exact definition somewhat vague, it is perhaps obvious that they're not looking for objects and stories from the Cultural Revolution. And indeed, the vast majority of entries um, on the, the WeChat platform and then those that later got made into these short clips um, are objects and stories related to the children's grandparents or great grandparents' experiences during the Sino Japanese um, War and the, the Chinese Civil War. Now, the objects that these, these students choose are, are, of course, ones that would be recognized as red relics by the red collectives but they represent a limited understanding of what the collectors themselves mean by the term red relic, especially since the objects from the pre-liberation period are numerically rather limited compared to those of the Mao years. Therefore, while the rhetoric of red and particularly Xi Jinping's emphasis on the importance of passing red culture onto the next generation aligns neatly with the motivations of the red collectors themselves, it excludes the objects of the vast majority of collectors. Because the National Red Collecting Association started off as a badge collecting association, and because badges were produced in such substantial numbers, badge collection have always been the most common type of collection. However, given badges close association with the Cultural Revolution, they're much harder to fit within this narrative of national rejuvenation under the CCP. And this is certainly something that I would suggest that collectors themselves are aware of. I've been noticing a shift within the last year or so within the collecting associations to emphasize more the revolutionary period collections rather than those from the Mao era, even if they're smaller numerically. Now, one of the things um, that uh, makes researching red collections um, quite interesting is that what they reflect about China and indeed even their own position within China um, seems to be somewhat kind of subject to change. I've been studying the field for five years now, and originally my understanding of red collectors was that they were reflecting a moment in China when things were changing so fast, so quickly, so much, um, and many people feared that the red era and that for which the party originally stood risked being left behind and forgotten. However, in the current climate in which Xi Jinping is spearheading a return to history, collectors and collecting associations are finding themselves increasingly in line with the party. Albeit, as I suggested, it's not a seamless fit. Um, but I do feel sure that they will be very keen to try to maintain this prominence and social legitimacy, um, regardless of what direction the party moves in the future. Uh, so I'll leave it there, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you.